What's up, everybody, and welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com. Well, of course, if you are watching on our fast-growing YouTube channel, that's Tar Hill Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And AJ just witnessed the Tar Heels lose 98-76 to to Wake Forest, um, capping off a bad week. I don't really know how, how, what other way you could really say it. Bad week for the Tar Heels, uh, especially when you look back. To, to that loss at Miami as well. Carolina getting scored 183 to 133 in their past two games. And like I said, mm-hmm. capping it off with another blowout loss in ACC play this time against the Demon Deacons. And, and just, let's, let's talk about energy. Uh, well, let's start there. Let's talk about how that kind of shifted early on because, I mean, you probably won't look at it looking at the scoreline. You probably wouldn't thank you. But Carolina was in this game at, at, at one point. It was 23 to 21 around the nine-minute mark. And, and Wake Forest just went on a 13 to two run and, I mean, for lack of a better word, just really never looked back. I think that was the – that was obviously the change in, in which Carolina just was never able to bounce back from it. It, it was really the, the shift in the game and what what triggered Wake Forest to win and really control the game as easy as they did, particularly in that second half. And what happened there, AJ? I mean, I'm obviously watching on TV, but you're in the arena. What happened during that stretch? Anything that kind of stands out that you could kind of put, put your finger on? That's – a couple of things. I tweeted out right before that run that, and Caroline wasn't shooting very well. I said, but you know, they're, they're playing, they're playing with energy. They're playing with some toughness and they're doing a lot of good things. And then the run hit and I got a lot of negative reaction on Twitter. You know, <laughs> what, what are you looking at? And, and are you watching the same game? I am that kind of stuff. And of course, a tweet like that's not going to go over too well when immediately a run happens and someone yeah. sees it 10 minutes later and the team's down by 12. So well, my point is, and I, mean, and I am answering your question with this, is that they did have a good uh, energy to them. They, they, they were playing, you know, with an extra skip in their step. They weren't scoring a lot. I mean, they weren't sh- they weren't converting a lot of shots. But they were both teams were getting a lot of shots. The game was up and down, so a lot of rebounds, a lot of shots, a lot of missed shots, that kind of thing. And, and we saw little moments like Puff Johnson getting that ball in the lane when that loose ball that he grabbed on the ground and and or he tied somebody up and and they led to a possession and and we saw Demarco Dunn come in early and confidently take two threes even though he missed them. We saw Justin McCoy give them uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of edge. It's something that we thought he was going to do a lot of this year, but he did for a moment. And, and the starters were they were they looked out in. Brady Manick was playing well early. They looked out in. Um, there was no discrepancy in energy or anything like that between the two teams. But then Wake, boom, hit a couple of shots, and Carolina does not handle opponents' runs well. This team. I don't know how to describe it. And I, I don't know. And we got to watch more before maybe something just kind of, you know, pops into my head and say, okay, this is the best way to describe it. Cause I don't want to mm-hmm. appear that I'm, you know, attacking or being overly critical in sort of an unfair way, but there's sort of a tail between their legs thing that happens when other teams punch them and they don't punch back. This club doesn't fight as much as this club should fight. And if they fought more, then their talent that they do have would show up more. Hubert Davis said after the game tonight, I asked him about those runs, about that run, about how when it does happen in games, I asked him if he senses a shift in demeanor or body language from his team. And he didn't really answer the question. He ended up talking about how, well, Wake's more talented. You know, LaRavia, Williamson, and Williams are more talented than the guys he has. And, of course, they're not. Look at the high school rankings. I know they're good college players. And look at what one of them started in, out at Indiana State. Another one started out at East Tennessee State. Another one didn't average in double figures last year at Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. So it's not like these guys have been tearing it up for a long time. So, But they're better on this particular night, right? So it's when Carolina shows up. He said that Miami's guards are better than his guards. They're, maybe they're not in the grand scheme of things, but they were when Carolina showed up. I think what happens, Jacob, mm-hmm. is – Bad stuff happens to this team and they don't have an on-court leader, which Hubert said last week they don't have uh, earlier in the week, rather, although he said Friday that maybe that's not the case. So some um, 
you know, different things that he's saying about that. But it's apparent when you watch the team that they don't have a fanny smacker. They don't have any emotional leader out there. They have nobody that can galvanize the troops and say, OK, guys, let's put our foot on this crap and stop it. It just it, it's like that thread in the sweater that you just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. And next thing you know, the sweater is a glove. And, and and that's what we saw tonight, because even though Miami didn't or Wake Forest didn't push it out to a massive halftime lead, they did score 25 points in the last nine minutes of the half. Caroline just stopped defending and then they started taking bad shots and they didn't get back in transition D and turnovers led to immediate points. Everything that's been an issue with this team remained an issue. And outside of rebounding and offensive rebounding tonight, there really wasn't anything that Carolina did well. Even though the first 10 minutes of the game, they had the mojo to win the game. They had the mojo to compete. But that 13-2 to two run phew, took the air out, and they never got it back. They never, ever made a push. They, they, In fact, you think it's only 10 points at halftime. And Brandon P. was here covering the game with me, THI. And we're like, you know, gosh, it's only down 10. It seems like a lot more than that. So great opportunity for a – Blue blood for a brand name for North Carolina, the front of New Jersey to come out, hit the opponent early, right out of the gate in the second half, get them on their heels and make a run. I've seen it happen a lot of times, right? Instead, Wake Forest scores six of its first seven possessions and score points, score baskets, and game was over. A- AJ, AJ was writing. I don't <laughs> do it. I, I, saw like Bob, I saw like Bob Dole and I referred to, my, referred to my per- myself in the third person. I was writing at the 12 minute mark again. So, that's that's they just don't handle runs well. There there is there is a mental fortitude that is does not exist right now. And certainly when those things happen, and for this team to become what it can become based on its personnel, the mental fortitude has to be there. If it's not, nothing else matters. Yeah. And and in Coral Gables and here in Winston Salem tonight, nothing else mattered, and that's why they got blown out two straight games. And by the way, this happened against Kentucky. It happened against Tennessee. This isn't the first time that they've put on this display. So it's a serious issue, and it's one that might not change this year. It might not get fixed, or it might get fixed. Maybe this is the bottoming out. If you're a Carolina fan and you're watching this or you're listening, you better hope that this was bottoming out. But I kind of thought the other night may have been that, but I guess it wasn't. Yeah, I thought it would be too, honestly. Kind of crazy when you look back to just a week or so ago, kind of what the vibe was around around this team. You know, A lot of people yeah. saying that they're one of the – hottest teams in the country and, and kind of heating up at the right time. And two games later, two blowouts in ACC play, like I said, getting outscored 183 to 133 in the last two games in losses at Miami and Wake Forest. It's just, it's not great. I, I'm going to go through some stats real quick before we dive into the second thing. Brady Manick led the way with 22 points for the Tar Heels. Also had eight rebounds, did up fouling out in the second half. RJ Davis, 18 points. Solid outing for him. Armando Bay caught another double-double, 12 points, 12 rebounds. So it was relatively quiet performance. It's only 4 of 12 from the field. But, I mean, just a double-double machine. Give credit to Armando Baycott for doing that. Uh, UNC shot just 33.3% from the floor on the night. Wake Forest, on the other hand, shot 54.2%. So, a really hot shooting night for Wake Forest. I mean, if you're just getting down to the basics of basketball, like Roy used to say, everything looks better when the ball goes in the net. And I think you see when there's shooting percentages and – you can understand pretty quickly why the Tar Heels lost by 22 to the Demon Deacons. But second thing I want to talk about, AJ, the couple of stats in particular, the Wake Forest dominated 50 to one to t- 51, excuse me, to 12 in the last two games. Carolina has been uh, outscored in points off turnovers this night, 21 to seven in advantage of Wake Forest. Wake Forest also had a 32, 30, excuse me, to two edge in fast break points. I mean, you know, Wake Forest really a, well. That's an alarming stat. Yeah, it really is when you look at it, and especially when you look at that combined last two games stat. Like I said, off points, off turnovers for Miami and Wake Forest, fifty-one to twelve. I mean, that's just it's just bad. There's no other way to look at it. And when you look at the break points, fast break points tonight for the Demon Deacons as well, 30, 30 to to two over Carolina. It's just it's not great. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And when you look at those stats in particular, you see why Wake Forest was able to get out and transition and do what they do. They were able to force some turnovers, only 11 turnovers for the Tar Heels. We have seen them have worse ones than that, but they were capitalizing on those turnovers, and that's what's really important. So, yeah, I think those two, when you look at those stats, when you drill down on those, especially going back to that Miami game, you're kind of starting to see a little bit of a theme and just just bad from Carolina tonight in those two respects. I never thought I'd see 30 to five in points off turnovers, but I saw it Tuesday night in Coral Gables. 
I never considered the thought that you might see a 30 to two in fast break points <laughs> in a game. And I saw that tonight. Yeah. You know, if you want to tell the story this week, start with those two numbers and then merge them together. And what's interesting is they weren't giving up a ton, you know, a lot, they've been giving up a lot of points off turnovers, especially in the games they've lost, but it hasn't always been the fast break variety. A lot of it has come after a team. I wouldn't say they set up, you know, a couple passes and get swinging around and then they get a bucket. But this goes back to what we talked about a few moments ago, the runs, this club doesn't handle adversity well at all. A, a run is a larger sample size of adversity, 13 to two. That takes several minutes, right? A turnover that leads to a breakout is a se- is a sequence in one of those sample sizes, right? That's what leads to 13 to two runs. They had a 10, nothing run at one point in the second half, and they give up lots of those chunks when they're not playing well, because they don't transition from a bad moment in the same moment to try to get the, to try to get a stop. I mean, I didn't see guys busted down the court. Uh, a lot of the turnovers are in the court of play. They're not the out of bounds variety with the dead ball and that kind of thing, unless it's an offensive foul, which they got a, one of, I think tonight, but they're turning the ball over in the middle of the court, just leading to a uh, quick opportunities for the opposition, or if it's not a quick opportunity, teams are able to run something and get a look. Mm-hmm. And they're just not, in, in football, Mac Brown calls it sudden change defense. When the football team would commit a turnover, the defense has suddenly got to get out on the field and defend the goal line or wherever the ball is. They got to defend it. I know a couple of years ago, they gave up a lot of points that way and they didn't do well in sudden change defense. In basketball, you have a lot of those situations because there's obviously a lot more possessions and a lot more turnovers, but Carolina's sudden change defense is bad. I mean, they're not a good defensive team as it is, but it's, it's almost mental. And I asked Caleb Love about that tonight, and he basically he, he kind of put a lot of blame on himself. I credit Caleb as a sophomore. He's saying more of the right things, and, and he, he views himself in the way that he should, and so he takes some responsibility for that. And I don't know how many turnovers he committed tonight, but whatever ones he did ended up leading to baskets. Same with RJ and same with everybody else. But then he said about the team that they – they they got to be they got to fight for each other a little bit more in those situations and I don't think we're seeing that it, it's all the oh man we made a mistake here we go again even if it's little snippets within a bigger stretch that's how you lose by twenty two at Wake Forest that's how you lose by twenty eight at Miami that's how you lose by twenty nine at Kentucky that's how you lose by seventeen at Tennessee. and and that's how you you know you lose like to Notre Dame when you're not ready to play and there were some games. Uh, earlier in the year that they won against Patsy's where they weren't really blowing those teams out and they were giving up points off turnovers coming into this game in their five losses, they had uh, average giving up 21.8 points off 13.2 turnovers. So usually you want to get like a average a point off a turnover, right? But teams are averaging like 1.7 points off turnovers. They're getting field goals. They're scoring on a regular basis. And they're getting looks. And that's a problem. And that kind of speaks to the first thing that you asked about, Jacob, about not handling runs well. They just don't handle adversity well at all. No, and not at all. It goes back to not having fanning spackers. goes back to not having leadership. I don't know what they're hearing from the sideline. Um, you know, people have questioned, is Hubert making moves to counter that? Is he using the bench as much, a lot as a motivator or enough as a motivator? I don't know. I mean, he answered Tuesday night when – when he's asked about the defensive problems, if you had Anthony Harris, who's a, one of their better on-ball defenders, would it have made a difference? And he said no, because I think his point in saying that was my team just didn't have it. Well, mm-hmm. after the first night, uh, 10 minutes of the game tonight, his team just didn't have it. They were outscored by 24 points over the last 29-13 of the game. Mm-hmm. That's bad. I know Wake's a good team. Wake's a surging program. There's no doubt about it, but it shouldn't happen in North Carolina. So, Lots of little sequences that lead to bigger stretches in the course of a game when you lose like this, the manner that they did, uh, that's where the ugliness lies. And uh, they've got to get tougher in dealing with all different varieties of adversity uh, or or they won't write this thing. They'll play well at times and they won't play well at times. And what we see right now is what we'll see in March. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's where it starts. you got to be able to respond to to, to some adversity and Carolina just doesn't do it. I mean, you couldn't have really said it any better than you did. 
Well, let's sit on the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap this thing up. I want to kind of talk about what this means because I think that's what a lot of Carolina fans are, are probably sitting there kind of wondering right, right now when you look back to how these last two games have gone for the Tar Heels. Looking ahead a little bit, got three games next week, all at home, four out of Carolina's next five games are in Chapel Hill, starting with Virginia Tech, then Boston College and NC State at Louisville after that, and then obviously Duke visits Chapel Hill on February 5th. So, I mean, I, I guess it's good that Carolina's heading back to Chapel Hill for a little bit of a home stretch. I mean, Carolina is 9-0 and at home this season, has definitely struggled on the road. I mean, it is a little bit of a positive to look ahead to. But I think when you look at how this team has performed, and, and I said it earlier, but how quickly the vibe around this program and how this, uh, this team particularly shifted really just a week going back to that UVA game, then kind of what happens this week. And I think a lot of Carolina fans are sitting there now like, oh, okay, like, Maybe we aren't as good as we thought we were not too long ago. And I think, it, you know, if you're thinking that right now, you can't really blame anybody for thinking that. So, you know, I think there's winnable games next week. I'll put it that way, especially when you look at them being in Chapel Hill. I mean, you, you could see Carolina feasibly winning all three games, but the way they're playing right now, you could very easily see them losing all three games too. So, AJ, what is this loss in, in the fashion in which – this loss went down and not only this loss, but we've got to look back to that Miami game too, because it does tie into it. What does this mean for the, for this team right now in this program as a whole? Uh, boy, there's a couple different areas we can go with this. Um, I think if you want to look big picture down the road and I'll, I'll cut it off a little bit and I'll, I'll talk more immediate in a second, but uh, they are in serious danger of not making the NCAA tournament. And mm-hmm. some people don't, like when I talk about that in January, but they're 0 and 5 in quad one games. They have one quad two win, and they only have three quad one games remaining. And one of them's at Virginia Tech, and Virginia, the Hokies are trending in the wrong direction. Yeah. They lost to Boston, Boston College that. today. Yep. So that may not even be a quad. They're, they're only two remaining quad one games, might be Duke. I, I think and that's very. I think that's probably what it's going to end up being. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even some of their quad two road games, like at State and at Louisville, yeah. those clubs, if they fall below 135 in the NET, those become quad three games. Mm-hmm. So big picture, if they're able to pick up a bunch of wins at home and, and kind of right the ship a little bit, where where are the resume-enhancing wins? Yeah, it's not where a lot of opportunities. Games? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know where those games are. Uh, they, they, I mean, the fact that they need to hope that Michigan gets on a roll to bolster that win, they need to hope the College of Charleston wins a lot. So if they climb into the top 30, 135, that becomes a Q2 road win. Uh, you know, the committee doesn't look at who it was, they just look at what the numbers are. Yeah. So yeah. a Q2 road win at College of Charleston will mean the same thing as a Q2 road win at Louisville to the committee. So that's, that's where they are. Now, more immediate. Uh, they don't, they shouldn't even worry about that right now. They just have to, they have to figure out how to fix a lot of these problems. And there are a lot of them, you know, imagine you got an experiment in front of you and you've got, okay, you got this problem here. You got this problem here. You got seven or eight different problems. And you got to ask yourself where, where in the, on earth do I start first? Yeah. Cause a lot of them are, you know, in the end in basketball, everything's sort of intertwined. So where do you start first? If, if the, if they're, what's the message from Hubert? What's the message from the staff? It, it clearly this week, whatever he said, didn't shift course, shift course of things, the course of things on the court. So can he shift the course of things tomorrow in practice in Chapel Hill with the Hokies coming in a Hokies team that's getting desperate, but a Hokies team that could shoot threes and drive on you a little bit from the wing. Kevin Aluma, who's going to guard him? Can't guard LaRavia. How are they going to guard Aluma? I mean, they've got some big issues to deal with, and, and, and it's kind of hard to figure out where to start first. Get the attitudes right. Get the minds right. But they've proven so far to sort of be a club whose mind and attitude is dependent on how the game's going, how things are going. So you've got to play well in order to get that vibe back again, right? Mm. So Hubert's job in the next 36 hours, 48 hours, or whatever it is before they play – uh, Virginia Tech on Monday night is to figure out a way to maybe give a different message or a different delivery of the message. That's why I asked them yesterday, do you change the message or do you change the delivery of the message? Because sometimes they're hearing the same thing over and over again. It's got to change. You got to shake things up. And I guess that's where it starts. It could just be a couple of guys being hot 
Monday night and they get yeah. a good vibe and they start to feel like they did before this road trip started and they get in a groove that way and they could build some confidence and build momentum because they can beat Virginia Tech. They should beat Boston College. I think NC State could cause some trouble for them with guys that can shoot threes and drive from, you know, from wing to wing, but they should beat NC State, right? And then they go to Louisville and Louisville's a hot mess right now. <laughs> but I mean, to say the least, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Carolina show, remember, I mean, what Hubert was saying tonight, you know, Wake's guys were great because our guys were there because we don't have the athletic ability to handle them. Same thing with uh, Miami. What happens if they go to Louisville and they don't have the ability to deal with Louisville being maybe playing like their backs are against the wall, something like that, like Carolina's going to be this week. So it, it, I hate cliches, but it, it's a one game at a time thing. But more than one game at a time, they've just got to deal with these things that are on the table and figure out whatever order it is. Mm-hmm. You know, don't go in there and just try to fix them all at one time because it's not possible. You know, if, if you buy a house and you have to do a lot of renovations, you don't work on all the renovations simultaneously. You fix a couple things first, then you go on to the next thing, you go on to the next thing. It's a checklist. And there's a checklist here that Hubert has to deal with. And the players do too. And there needs to be accountability. There needs to be total honesty in the program. And he was singing the praises big time of these guys for a long time. And then suddenly tonight, well, they're not really that good. This is the same team he said six weeks ago could win a national championship. So whatever the message is, whatever the, whatever kind of change he makes in the way they do things tomorrow or a vibe or something like that, somebody's got to shake things up for the sake of shaking things up. So I would guess that until the mindset changes a little bit, it's kind of hard to see them fixing a lot of these other issues. I don't think this is ever going to be a really good defensive team. They're not supremely athletic. They don't have great bounce, but they can do other things to work around that. They could find other ways maybe to defend and to, to not expose their guys. You know, they had a couple of bigs today, just like the other night in Miami, a player on the other team gets them on their hip and he can work. Them. Well, maybe try something a little bit different. I, I think change for the sake of change can actually work at times uh i I don't think it's a long-term solution but it could kind of jumpstart things back on track and if they do that and they become the team we saw against virginia the team we saw against boston college on the road in atlanta the team we saw at home against georgia tech the team that we saw against michigan that team's still there but you gotta maybe electroshock this bunch to sort of allow that group to, to come out because right now um, the way that they played this week is got to be an albatross over this group because this is not a confident team. The body language is terrible tonight. And it's not the first time. And I would think that human nature suggests that they're losing some confidence, whether it's in themselves individ- as individuals, whether it's in each other, whether it's in Hubert. I don't know what it is, but they have to be electroshocked into something. Something has to shift for the sake of shift and change. Yeah. And, and I think that there's still a lot of season left. Uh, if there's a positive, they have 13 ACC games left and eight of them are at home. So, and a couple of the road win, road ones, you know, they've got Clemson on the road. They're very beatable. Virginia Tech on the road. They're very beatable. NC State on the road. They're very beatable. Louisville on the road. They're very beatable. Duke is kind of over there and doing what Duke does. And I think that, and then have to go to Florida State. Florida State's got to come in Chapel Hill. I think they're, they would be a tough out. So, if they can get the mojo right, they have the personnel that they can still make something out of this season. And we can look back and say, man, they were terrible at stretch in January. They were bad at times in November and December, but they figured things out because there are teams every year that make a run that have stretches similar to this and they figure it out. They certainly have plenty of intel, Jacob, about what not to do and what doesn't work. Mm. So, they need to use that to their advantage and say, okay, well, let's not do A, B, C, D, E, and F anymore, or at least be a little bit better at those things. Mm-hmm. It would make a world of difference. Yeah, it's definitely a team right now that I think is uh, safe to say is in uh, a search for its identity. You know, looking at looking at just, just how this week's gone down. I know I keep hitting on it, but two back-to-back bad losses, and we tied a podcast earlier this week, I believe we put out on Monday, talking about how big of a opportunity the Tar Heels had this week going up on the road to two hot teams and two of the best teams in the ACC at this point and losing in the fashion they did. It's one thing to lose those games, but losing the fashion that Carolina did, I, I think it's put this team in a bit of an identity crisis. And, you know, or, I can't really sit here and, and really tell you who this team is and what this team is. The only thing I can guarantee you about this team is it seems that 
when they come up against good teams, especially away from Chapel Hill. They just don't seem to have a clue. So maybe that is their identity. Yeah. Maybe I mean, we know the identity and we don't have to search anymore because we've seen it. Yeah. They don't respond to, to, um, to negativity well, and it cascades out of control. And when things are going right, they're really good. So maybe that is their identity. They'll, they'll determine. It's not us to determine what their identity is. It's up to them to determine what the identity is as a team. And, you know, I've told you that since, since you came on board. You know, I judge teams by their stated mission, especially if it's realistic. And then they tell us, they dictate what we write, what we say based on their performance. Mm-hmm. So maybe that is their identity. Or maybe it's not. Maybe we're singing a different tune here in about three weeks. Well, we'll see in three weeks. We'll see. They're going to play the games, right? Yeah. We'll but definitely it's possible as we get into late January that perhaps this is their identity. Yeah. I think it is safe to say that. We'll see what happens, though. Like you said, a lot of basketball still left to be played, especially in the ACC. So we'll see what happens with the Tar Heels. But tough one for them tonight in Winston-Salem, losing 98-76 to to Wake Forest. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Appreciate you guys watching, as always. Make sure you keep it locked to tarillustrated.com for all your post-game coverage from Winston-Salem and obviously all your coverage leading up to and at the Virginia Tech game on Monday night. Relatively quick turnaround for the Tar Heels. Make sure you guys like, share, subscribe, hit that notification bell as well so you know every single time we upload, and we'll see you all in the next one. Thanks. Thanks.